Um, but even if you ignore cement emissions, we are going to currently use up the total budget for 2 degrees C by 2030. That's the, that's the outside budget. If you use the, <coughs> um, the, the lower end of the budget for 2 degrees C, we're going to run, it, run out of all of it by 2022. So these, the you know, current rates we're going, we're going to have no hope for 2 degrees C. This is global, you remember. I'll come back to that in a minute. So recent evidence tends to support, recent history supports the IA view, the International Energy Agency, who have not really ever been a you know, radical left-wing think tank, they generally have been the sort of mouthpiece of the, um, of the energy industry, but they are saying some very interesting and carefully worded things now, right across the board, so it's really worth looking at their, their, their analysis on all sorts of subjects. Um, CO2 trend perfectly aligned with 6 degrees C temperature rise, um, which will devastating consequences for the planet. Now, whether it's 4, whether it's 6, you know, what we're saying is very large temperature rises occurring very rapidly, which is more important, I suppose, um, which will have devastating cons consequences for the planet. I don't think anyone, I don't think even the sceptics would would disagree with that. Um, so what about 2 degrees C, which I think we still, we should still get to. Uh, that's 46. Um, if we think of 2 degrees C, it looks something like that. That's, that's actually taken, I think, 1,300 gigaton budget rather than 1,000 gigaton that's in the synthesis report. But yeah, it doesn't matter too much. Uh, so that's, that's what we'd have to do for 2 degrees C. There's an enormous gap between the two. And the worrying thing about this, this is the bit I do a lot of work on, and so I start working on energy, is that you can't do that with low carbon supply. You can't make the changes quick enough. You cannot build the things quick enough. You have to do something with our demand for energy. And that is very, very unpopular amongst all of us, all of our colleagues, all the policymakers. So basically the whole world, who's a high, they're all the high emitting parts of the world, which is a small proportion. None of us like this at all. That's why we don't really like the science. To tell the things we don't want to hear. So is it reasonable to assume you cannot make these sorts of changes quickly enough? And you get the minuses of this world, or the Monbiot, or the Lovebox, then you do it with nuclear power. That's, that's a bit unfair, and Monbiot is much more refined. But minus is this, for the ignorant view of it. Um, so nuclear power, a good example of it. I'm agnostic about nuclear power. I was brought up next to one. My dad works as a fitter in the nuclear power station and died as a consequence. But I remain um, agnostic about whether nuclear power is good or bad from other, other points of view. But from a climate perspective, it's very low carbon. And that, at the moment, that's what I'm concerned with here. Its emissions are 5, 15 grams per kilowatt hour, which is roughly the same as nuclear, as, as, as the renewable range. So it's way lower than CCS, way lower than anything else that's out there other than the renewable. Um, yeah, so much lower than gas or CCS, for instance. From a global perspective, that's the final energy consumption that we use, just terawatt hour to lots of, lots of energy. That's how much we actually consume. It's not, not, not primary energy. It's not taking the, the account of the loss from the power stations. That's what we actually use to do the things we like to do in our lives. That's lots of energy. Um, electricity consumption is 20,000 um, terawatts. Now that's um, terawatt hours. That's pretty typical for most industrialised countries. It varies a bit. 20% is very common. So the UK is 20%, much of Europe is 20%, Sweden's just 35%, and um, France is higher as well. But most industrial, industrialised parts of the world, 80% of the energy we consume is not electricity. Yet we always think about wind turbines, nuclear power, we always talk about electricity and, and energy as if they're the same thing. Both begin in E, both end in Y, but they're quite different. Um, nuclear power provides 11.5% of the world's electricity. So that means nuclear power provides 2.5% of global energy demand. Now, if you're going to go low carbon, you have to put a lot more things in the grid. So electricity looks like, the penetration of electricity looks like it has to go up very significantly, maybe 60, 80% of energy has to come from electricity. Because what else is, else is there outside of that? Probably biomass, if you can make it sustain, grow it sustainably, and possibly hydrogen, which makes, uh, often is produced from electricity anyway, or from thermal decomposition. But anyway. um, so 2.5% of global energy demand is what nuclear provides today. There are 435 new, uh, nuclear power stations that provide that energy. And so when you get the, the Monbios or the Linuses or others saying nuclear power is really the solution here, you have to say, well, how long will it take to build them? How many are we are building today? Well, we're building 70 at the moment. Put it on there, I thought I'd put it on there. We're building 70 at the moment. So to buy 25% of the global energy demand, which would not be unreasonable in the sort of scenarios people talk about, if nuclear is provided as a low carbon source, provide the <coughs> type of energy we need, you'd need about 4,000 new nuclear power stations in about 30 years, and we're building 70. So just, you know, people have to go and do some contextual analysis around the assumptions that they make. These sort of things are embedded in all sorts of IMs and other, other things. They just assume at a point that things suddenly shoot up and, hey presto, we've got all of these new technologies. And it takes a long time to build nuclear power stations and a long time to put all the other systems around it as well. That assumes you've got enough uranium-235 as well, um, or you transfer it to the building or something. So I think it's fair to say that that's, that's correct. So we have to reduce demand. The low carbon supply is a prerequisite. You have to have it. So we need to build, build that stuff like there's no tomorrow, and I'll come back to that briefly later on. 
But remember, this is a global analysis, and we were signed up on the basis of equity. So we've signed <coughs> up to do something whereby the poorer parts of the world get longer to make the transition across. And yet that's, that's not actually in all the policies we develop for our own countries. We assume they're not going to do that. But you know, our rhetoric says, yes, they're going to give them some space to, to develop and industrialise and improve their welfare, which I think we'd all think is not an unreasonable thing. So this is a much more demanding situation for us. So often you get, I mean, I do this numerous scenarios, millions of scenarios out for all sorts of people on what the future might look like from an aging perspective. And you often get told, oh, let's, you're, not, you're not putting enough pressure on the poorer parts of the world, which I think is unfair from the sort of analysis that we've done. We're assuming in our, our work is that these are very rough figures that capture a lot of the other work we're doing as well, but that the poorer parts of the world could peak by 2025. That's enormously challenging. That's all of the other parts of the world, but I think it's viable. It's <coughs> just about viable. And China, is, as Peter said before, China dominates that, but actually yeah, India will start to dominate that or start to become very significant. But I still think collectively we could probably get a peak in 2025 if we were really serious about these issues. And that, that has to be a higher number now. If they could then start by 2030 to reduce their emissions at 10% per annum, which is three times faster than Stern says is possible with a growing economy, but I'm not taking too much. I like Stern for lots of other reasons about his view on discount rates, but in terms of things like this, I think the views of economists are almost irrelevant. And we don't know what, how fast we can reduce emissions instead of a growing economy if, if we think the growing economy is good. But the economists tell us that, that the rate we need now for this, for this is, is three times faster than that if it's possible for the growing economy. So that is hugely challenging. But then you sort of say, well, okay, let's imagine they achieve all of that, and we can work out the budget for those parts of the world. What's left for the rest of us? What's left for the wealthy parts of the world that's caused the problem, knowingly caused the problem for 25 years? We'd have to have at least 10% per annum reduction starting in 2011. So as we're, we're updating this now, looking at some of the later numbers, which make it much higher than that. We think those numbers are going to be considerably higher. So starting immediately to give us a 50-50 chance of avoiding dangerous climate change that we sign up to as a democracy every single year. And probably as many of us as scientists actually work in that sort of terrain. And um, that's a 40% reduction by 2018. So imagine your own life and say you want a 40% reduction in your energy consumption by 2018, which would go roughly with a 40% reduction in our energy, in our emissions. Because in that time frame, you're not going to change the, the uh, supply system very much. 70% reduction by 2024, and this is why I've written to the PM and others about this. And um, before we had the, uh, the EU policy on 40% reduction by, 20, by 2030, which again has very little to do with supplies, nothing to do with 2 degrees C. You basically need to be 90 plus percent reduction in our emissions from the wealthy parts of the world by about 2030 to give us a 50-50-ish um, you know, chance at 2 degrees C. And that's with very demanding um, constraints on the poor parts of the world. So it's not unreasonable for people to say that the chance at 2 degrees C are very slim. I think this is still viable, and I'm going to come to that. These are radical emission reductions, way beyond anything that's countenance now. Any of, the, any of the standard reports that come out there, they've got the great and good names on it somewhere, will not cover any of this stuff at all. It'll be glossed over with lots of eloquence and nice words and photographs. But we don't like the numbers. And that includes the research council. They do not like the idea of thinking of this as the challenge. They much prefer the 80% reduction by 2050.